So uh, what I'm going to talk today is about the tests that are done um, according to the Annex A of the ISO guideline 10993 to test biocompatibility safety of medical devices. So the safety evaluation of medical devices is a requirement by the FDA. It's also required by uh, worldwide agencies. And usually there is a guidance, uh, ISO 10993, that describes what are the processes for the biologic evaluation of medical devices. And these, the tests that are required and they are done and how they should be done. And there's an Annex A that uh, has a, lot, a matrix that tells you for the type of device that you have, what are the tests that you should be doing or considering doing. This is what the matrix looks like. So basically, it will depend largely on the category of your medical device. If you have a surface device, an external communication device, or an implant device, and then what types of contacts you have, the duration of the contacts, and these are the types of tests, categories that you can do. And based on the type of the, your device, you will have to do some of them or others. Now, the most common ones, the ones that are highlighted here, are the ones that are usually common to all medical devices. These are cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation or intracutaneous reactivity. So these are the most common. As you can see, pretty much every single device, except maybe this one, this one here, all need this type of assessment. The other ones will be on as a needed, a needed basis and depending on your medical device that you have. So what types of tests can you do or should you do? Usually the choice of the tests, uh, the t effects that you need to test for depend largely on the toxicological risk assessment that is done after the characterization of your medical device. You perform an extract, you analyze that, uh, and based on the chemical constitution or the, of the extract profile, you may need to uh, perform any of these tests. Now, depending on the, the, the usage or the clinical use of your medical device, you may need to conduct short-term uh, tests that uh, evaluate short-term effects, such as cytotoxicity, acute toxicity, irritation, sensitization, and immunocompatibility. And for uh, devices that will be in contact for longer period of times, you may need to do and evaluate longer-term uh, toxic effects for longer-term exposures, such as in chronic implantation, potentially some genotoxicity, carcinogenicity, these are together, and even potentially some reproduction uh, effects and tests for that. So I'm going to talk about these categories very briefly because we don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you an overall idea what these tests are. So I'm going to start with the most common one, uh, most common types of tests, which are cytotoxicity that are required for pretty much uh, every single type of medical device. So if the cytotoxicity is the capacity of a test substance, in the case of medical device, it will be a medical device extract to cause damage or death to a cell. This is what cells look like, and this is what an intact cell monolayer is, and this is when you have damage. They're just dead, they're not there. So there's basically uh, three large categories for the test procedures for cytotoxicity. One of them that is very common for uh, medical devices is when you test an extract, uh, but you could also test a medical device directly without it being an, uh, by direct contact and also by indirect contact without the use of an extract. What are extracts? An extract is when you use uh, usually cell culture medium and you place your medical device in the cell culture media and you incubate it at 37 degrees for 24 hours plus or minus two hours. So this is what gives you your extract. Now there's other conditions of extracts. There are the temperatures and there's a, a complicated, based on the type of device, on your regulatory endpoints. But in general, you know, if you have a 24 hour, 37, that gives you extract. Then the extract is put in contact with the cell culture, which a monolayer, and then uh, for a certain period of time, at least four hours. And then after that, then after a certain amount of time, you look at what happens and what is the reactivity in the cell culture. If you have no effects, a slight, mild, moderate, or severe, and this, uh, usually anything above a two is considered to be a cytotoxic effect. So that's the basis of the tests. What type of evaluations can you do? 
you can do a qualitative evaluation. That means you look at the cells and based what, what they look, if most of them are dead, you're really looking at something that is severe and you give it a, a, a severe grade just based on qualitative. But there are also some other biochemical analysis also for cytotoxicity, such as the XCT. These are different types of dyes, but they represent the same type of test where you use multiple dilutions of your extract, and this will actually give you a quantitative assessment of cytotoxicity. So you know at each percent of the cell extract, you have death or cytotoxicity. You don't need to do both, but if you have something that is equivocal here, you may need to do this one. So it depends on the strategy, on the chemical characterization, and your submission and regulatory endpoints. In terms of the direct contact, it's as the test says, the test substance, in this case, could be a medical device or a section of a medical device. For instance, a latex glove is a medical device. You can cut a piece of the latex glove and put it directly in contact with the cell layer. Usually direct cell contact, not always, but it's very common to do just a qualitative assessment, very similar to what we've seen based on the reaction around the location where you put your medical device. You can also do a quantitative assessment that would be very similar to what we've seen with the extracts. Now, the direct cell contact, there's two major guidelines, the ISO that we already talked about, and there's also a USB guideline that provides guidance to, to, to run direct contact tests. They are not very different, they're very similar, minor differences. Uh, the difference, uh, one of the differences is in the classification, but if you look from here to here, there's not a big difference between the two criteria for evaluation of cytotoxicity, and they both consider something to be cytotoxic if you have a grade two or above. Finally, well, uh, indirect contact tests is uh, if you think that your medical device is going to damage directly the cell just by its presence and not necessarily by what it leaches, you may also perform do a, a protection by using an agar layer where you're going to place your test article above so you know that there are no mechanical injury to the cells. Anything that comes and causes cytotoxicity is due by leaching or, being, or extracting from the medical device. This usually is done something uh, that is qualitative. Uh, another type that is also commonly used is the use of a paper filter in between the cell layer and the test substance to protect for those uh, effects, and both of these provide qualitative assessments. So as you can see, uh, these tests have an extreme sensitivity. It's not really a pass-fail, even though we say anything above due is going to be cytotoxic, but there's uh, somewhat, uh, you need to consider this in conjunction with all the information that you have for that test. Uh, it is an indicator of potential in vivo cytotoxicity, and, they, uh, and any cytotoxic effects are of concern. But you don't just run one test, get a positive, and move on. If you get something positive, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, your evaluation is done. You may need to consider modifications to your medical device or to the cell conditions or to the test conditions in order to further evaluation why it's positive. So basically, cytotoxic data is not the only and sole determination of uh, a pass or fail for a medical device for clinical use. Now, for another type of tests that are very common to are the irritation sensitization tests with the cytotoxicities are required for pretty much every single medical device. This irritation and uh, sensitization tests are guided, are there, the, they are described, the, the conduction of the test under ISO guideline 10993 part 10, and they are used for any medical device that, that is a contact device because the main organ that they evaluate a reaction on is the skin. And you can use uh, the type of device will dictate what type of irritation test you need. And even though you, know, you can use in vitro uh, irritation tests, some of the cases you also may or may not need to conduct animal testing. And I'm gonna go very briefly over these types of tests. So if you already know that your device has a pH that is under two or above 11.5, basic or acidic, uh, acidic or basic actually, you may not need to require any further testing. It's automatically considered a skin irritant. But if you're not, in most of the cases you, you don't have the situation, uh, you will perform, you will need to perform irritation tests. Now I'm going to talk about only two of the potential irritation tests that there are. There are probably others. Um, 
one of them, these two that are in vitro, one, uh, the in vitro irritation uh, test under, uh, that is also described in the OECD guideline 430 that uses rat skin in the transcutaneous lactic resistant module, and it, it is used to identify corrosives. This is what, uh, there's, there's disks of cells where the test substance or the extract will be applied, and you check for the results. You apply it at up to 24 hours of application. You can also do an assessment that is qualitative, or you can use uh, a, a dye binding step, like the, the MTT is a, a type of dye, to evaluate also a percent in a quantitative assessment uh, to, confer, to confirm and to further evaluate positive results. So this is the rat test. And then there is a counterpart that is the human test, also in vitro. And this one uses the human reconstructed epidermis. This is actually a picture of the human epidermis. Um, and so the idea is to construct a model that is very similar to the human epidermis. It is obtained from human-derived non-transformed epidermal keratinocytes that mimic the histological and morphologic biochemical properties of the skin. And this purpose is to also evaluate the irritation and ultimately, uh, if uh, it is the only thing that is required, the idea is that these skin irritation tests could potentially replace the rabbit acute skin irritation assessment. That means in, vi in vivo testing. So let's go into the in vivo test, irritation tests. So basically, they evaluate signs at first contact. It is, the irritation has got to be something that it, and it's a non-specific inflammatory response. It could be done with a single application or repeated application. It depends on the type of device that you have. You're going to choose one or multiple applications. And uh, you are going to evaluate this inflammation. And obviously, you have the skin irritation test. There's a test that incutane, intercutaneous reactivity. And then you have a series of tests that are also irritation. And these are really largely going to be needed or not if your medical device is going to be in contact with any of these mucosas. So if you, for instance, if your medical device is going to be in contact, it's a vaginal product, you will likely uh, need to evaluate vaginal irritation. If it's something that is going to be contact with your oral mucosa, you do the oral irritation. So you don't need all of them. Just depends on what device that you use. The most common that is usually done is the the primary skin or in vitro uh, skin irritation test. The animal model is the rabbit. The reason the rabbits are used is because they are very sensitive for skin irritation. So you want to use a model that is very sensitive. And basically, this is the head of the rabbit, this is the tail of the rabbit, the caudal hand, and you use your test site where you apply your extract. You have two of them, and two of them you're going to apply your, uh, are going to be your control sites. After you do the application on the skin, you're going to score right after the application, one hour after the application, and at three different time points. You score for two different types of skin reactions, the erythema, that's the redness, or the edema, which is the swelling. And then based on this score, you're going to, and I'll talk a little bit more how you get your primary irritation index. Based, you calculate your irritation index, and based on that, you will have something that is a negligible or non-irritant, slight irritant, moderate or severe irritant. For scoring, you usually only look at three time points, the last three time points, the 24, 48, and 72 hours. Uh, and you make some calculations, that, and then based also on the number of animals that you utilize, you get your primary irritation index. Now, the simple primary skin irritation only has one single administration and four point points of evaluation, but you have a device that is going to be in contact with the skin for multiple times repeatedly. You may need to have a repeated exposure, and you, then you'll calculate your irritation score based on that repeated exposure. The intercutaneous reactivity, it really is done while the primary skin rotation is by contact, you apply on the skin. Here you apply in the skin and you by injection inside the dermis. And usually the, the volume is standard, it's 2.2 ml. And you have to do your extract with a polar and a non-polar extract. And then you score it the, in a very similar way that you do for the primary irritation test. You also score the edema and the swelling and the erythema, the redness. It's a little bit of a complex because you have polar and no polar extracts. You get your positive, you have your control sites. But this is usually what it's going to look like for the intercutaneous reactivity. And then you use pretty much the same scale for the evaluation and the calculation of the results.
Now let's uh, talk a little bit about the other types of irritation tests that you can do. The, uh, there's a little bit difference uh, on the models that are used. The ocular or the eye irritation test is usually done also in rabbits because rabbits have a very large eye and it's, very sim it's, it's thought to be more similar to the human eye than other species. And you treat, uh, you apply in one eye the, the extract and the contralateral eye, you guys, it's gonna be your control. And the observation is also be done uh, if it's acute or multiple, but usually at 1, 24, 48, or 72 hours, you can have one or multiple, multiple applications. You look macroscopically at different components of the eye, and after the evaluation, you either come up with a positive result, if it's an irritant, or negative, it's not irritant. Vaginal irritation is very similar, but you use also the, uh, the, the rabbit. And the final end point for the, all the other irritation tests that I'm gonna talk is going to be microscopic scoring. So there's a pathologist that looks at those slides and will tell you if it's an irritant or not based on a scale that is provided by ISO. The oral irritation, the difference is going to be done in the AMSTER, the serum AMSTERs, but the irritation index is also going to be based on microscopic evaluation. Rectal epinile uh, irritations, uh, again, the rabbit in microscopic evaluation is what's gonna give you your scoring. So this test were to see if it's an irritant. The third type of test is to evaluate sensitization. Does your device cause or will cause or has the potential to cause allergies that are uh, usually immunological, that are always immunological mediated or cutaneous responses? And uh, in order to evaluate that, it, to see if there's a potential for human sensitization, there are some models that you can use, and you, can ch these, you don't use them all. You just choose one of these three tests. One of them is the guinea pig max maximization test. This is one of the preferred by the FDA. The Bueller test, both these two tests use the guinea pig, that's the animal model, and the local lymph node assay uses mice as the animal model. For uh, allergens, what you're trying to look at is for type 4 delayed hypersensitivity responses. And there's going to be a time frame for administration of the sensitization test substance and for the evaluation. You'll really look at uh, telophocyte formation. And an example of this type of uh, disease for uh, type 4 hypersensitivity is the contact dermatitis. I'm going to talk first of the guinea pig maximization test. It's a test that is run in three phases. The first one is where you inject inside the dermis your undiluted extract, so extract of your medical device. You have a site where you put the, the complete front adjuvant, which is kind of a positive control, and then you have uh, also a combination of this plus the test sub substance. You don't in order to evaluate sensitization, you don't want necessarily to induce a lot of irritation because irritation can mask the sensitization. So you choose a dose that causes mild to moderate, but not necessarily a lot of skin irritation. Seven days after that, you do the induction phase where you actually apply a, a patch, so this is going to be on the skin, and then uh, 14 days after the first challenge, you would have the, the challenge phase where you apply also topically the test substance and the control. These are the three phases. So one intradermal, one dermal, and one uh, topical. The evaluation is done on a, a scale that is also described in the guideline, in the part 10 of the guideline, whether there's no visible Change, uh, change discrete erythema, redness, on the way to confluent, confluent erythema and erythema and swelling. And any scores above one usually indicate sensitization. The Bueller test is slightly simpler. In, there's an induction phase where the, the test substance is applied on the skin and then a challenge phase. Other than that is not very different from the maximization test. And finally, we have the local lymph node assay that uses a mice, CBA uh, mice usually, and w the difference is that you're going to apply the test substance in the dorsum of the ears, and, and then on day five after application, you inject uh, 
a marker compound that is going to tell you if there is reactivity in the local lymph node right under the skin. After that, you isolate the lymph node and you evaluate the, the rate of incorporation of the timidin. And based on this, you compare that rate incorporation with the control value, and if the, the comparison is, is called uh, the stimulation index, if it's above three, it also indicates if it's three times more than your control, that would mean that you have a sensitizer. Here's a little drawing for these three different types of tests. Maximization, the one that has three phases, the Bueller, only two phases, and then the LLNA that is done in the mice, that you got actually a quantitative response opposite to these two tests that are qualitative. Now, the LLNA, according to the FDA guidance, on airs a limitation for devices that are made from novel materials. That means they have not previously used in a legal, legally U.S. marketed medical device or when the testing substances do not penetrate the skin, but are used in devices that contact deep tissues or breach surfaces. Uh, the recommendation is to use the guinea pig maximization test, the MNK. Now, for novel materials, if it's unknown, where the chemicals will be able to penetrate the skin, in the skin, LLNA test, or um, uh, in an LLNA. So if you cannot penetrate the skin, basically, the guinea pig maximization MNK test is also recommended by the FDA according to their guidance. So these are the three types of tests that are going to be mostly required for um, all types of medical devices. Medical devices that will contact with the body or be in the body for a longer period of time may require uh, evaluation of systemic effects if there's further from just a local effect. So you can also have evaluation of systemic toxicity under a, a, an acute toxicity a very short period of time. So these types of tests will depend on how long your medical device will contact with the body and will be, there's a possible for exposure, for systemic exposure. So for, period, for medical devices that will contact less than 24 hours, you can evaluate acute toxicity. This, this includes medical devices, their extracts, leachables, degradation periods. If you have a period that is no less than 24 hours, but it's no greater than 10% of the total lifespan of the test animal, then you may need to evaluate subacute of subchronic toxicity. This would also depend on whether if there's any toxicity data, chronic toxicity data available. If there is, then you may not need to require or do any additional tests. If feasible, subacute subchronic systemic toxicity products may be expanded to include implantation tests. And we'll talk a little bit about implantation tests later. Um, and what this means is that if you're going to implant the device in the same study what you perform the implantation, you can use that same study to evaluate systemic toxicity. Chronic, chronic toxicity tests are, te uh, are for products that are going to be, uh, where the exposure is going to be during a major period of the lifespan of the animal or the human being. So, uh, what are some of the guidelines to test for repeat dose and to evaluate systemic toxicity? So if you have an acute test, usually you can use rodents. They are commonly used for that, five animals per sex per group, or non-rodents, such as we already taught, like the rabbit. We usually use three rabbits are sufficient. If you look for subacute, uh, usually 10 and subchronic 10, 10 to 20, and it really, uh, how do you choose this? It really depends on the endpoints that you want to evaluate, on the information that is available, and on the profile and the types of chemicals that are in your extract. For chronic uh, studies, such as uh, long duration and uh, even carcinogenicity studies, you may have 15, or you, sometimes you may have more than that. The route of administration, because we're talking about extracts, the most common routes of administration for extracts are going to be either IV, intravenous, or interperitoneal. And the vehicles, as we can see here for the interperitoneal, sesame oil is preferred, and uh, for the intravenous, you can use saline or a PVS. Am I right? <laughs> 
What kinds of things do you look for? So it depends on the duration of your studies. Usually body weights are common to everything. You want to know if there's a change in the body weight due to the administration. Clinical observations are also common. So these are common for everything. You want to see if there's anything adverse in the behavior of the animal. But when you start looking for a longer duration test, and certainly for chronic tests, you also want to look at the clinical pathology, that's your red blood cell or hematology evaluation, your serum chemistry, and also possibly um, your coagulation, if there's any effect in coagulation, which is important for any uh, device that will contact with the blood. Gross pathology is necropsy, so when the animals are uh, evaluated microscopically for any alterations in the bodies and systems. The same thing with organ weights, these are usually collected for subchronic and chronic studies. And finally, you have this pathology, uh, certainly in the chronic studies and possibly also in the subacute studies to, uh, studies to look for any alterations in terms of organs and systems. And the histopathology, which is to look at the tissues and organs under the microscope, is the ultimate endpoint to evaluate a toxicity. So how do you choose your organs and systems that you are going to look at? So there are two tiers. There's a tier one tissue. This is if you, if you have a product, probably a subchronic study or an implantation study, I just want to take a look at the major organs and systems. These are the ones that you should look at. When you're talking for carcinogenicity, chronicity, and subchronic studies, usually you want to look at pretty much any organ available to all the different types of systems that you're going to evaluate. So it's pretty extensive. All right, so this is the systemic toxicity. Let's talk a little bit about implantation. So I implantation tests are used to evaluate local pathological effects on the living tissue, either at the gross level or microscopic level, and the microscopic level, when a medical device is implanted into the area that it's intended to be implanted or any other area that you feel that is a good representative for the evaluation of the system. Implantation uh, testing is guided by part six of ISO 10993. And the materials that you should or should be evaluated could be soluble, solid and non-biodegradable, so it's like a stint, usually there's no biodegradation in that. But also if they are uh, resorbable or degradable, like a suture material, and also non-solid non uh, porous materials like meshes, uh, liquid space, or other particles. Test specimen is implanted into the site of the animal species that uh, you need to choose an appropriate species, and I'll talk a little bit more what the species that you can choose. But it's important to know that these tests here are done for safety. It is not the objective of this implantation test to evaluate the performance or the mechanical or functional loading of your medical device. No engineering evaluation here. Here you're mostly interested in evaluating safety. Um, if you if you have a product that is going to be only in contact with the skin, but you think that the, the skin that is going to contact to the clinical use is going to be, the skin is going to be breached, or there's going to be an issue with the skin, it's not going to be continuous, there's a possibility that there will be also a requirement to do an implantation study. It is not uncommon, as a matter of fact, it's a very common thing to do, it's kind of the practice that the evaluation of implantation is done in comparison with a material that has already been uh, described, a control material that is clinically acceptable and that has been characterized in terms of biocompatibility. This will be your control material, and then you compare it with your test system. And it's very important for some of the materials that are biodegradable to look at the history and the evolution of the response to the tissue. And as I said, the degradation characteristics for degradable and resorbable materials and as I said before, too, if you were not sleeping after lunch, <laughs> that um, it's also, there's a good possibility, and it's accepted by the regulatory authorities, that uh, you'll use this implantation not just to look at the site where you're going to put the implant, but also to look at the systemic effects in some of the tier one organs that we discussed. So you can use these types of tests to evaluate systemic effects, too. Also important to note is that implantation tests, uh, the objective of this test is not to evaluate carcinogenicity or teratogenicity, which is the, the possibility to cause birth defects, because mostly these are not implanted in pregnant animals. 
or mutagenicity. So uh, to, to, we can stretch it, I mean, we can use it to evaluate systemic toxicity, but there are limitations on what an implantation test should be, and certainly you shouldn't be using it for these purposes. But if you have a long-term implantation study, sometimes these longer-term implantation studies may, be, provide, may provide you some, some insight uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, cancer or carcinogenicity evaluations. So even though it's not the main purpose, you know, any information that you get from the studies could be relevant and should be taken into consideration when you do your final briefing and your toxicological risk assessment after you perform your assessment, uh, all your testing. Um, systemic toxicity studies conducted may satisfy, as I said, you may have enough data to satisfy also requirements for systemic toxicity. So there's two major guidelines, the ISO definitely that we've been talking about. There's another guideline, the USP guideline, that also tests and evaluate and, and gives some uh, guidance on how to perform implantation tests. Talking about the implantation test under ISO 10993 part six, uh, depending on the types of materials, if you're looking for a short-term or longer uh, response, you may have a certain um, duration of exposure or implantation. And if you have some degradable material, you have at least uh, a minimal degradation of one to 12 weeks. And also the implantation period in weeks also depends and is guided by the type of species that you use. Larger species, usually the duration is larger, uh, longer. A lot of these te uh, the implants that are done in larger species are done to actually test the actual clinical device because they are sometimes too large to be used in smaller species. So here again, you try to, to maximize your studies to do uh, other endpoints like thrombogenicity, uh, systemic toxicity, potentially some insights into carcinogenicity. The, the implantation site really depends on the clinical and the likely clinical exposure. Common sites will be the muscle, the subcutaneous tissue, and the bone. The, what we look at, in addition to the systemic effects, you look at the macroscopic and microscopic effects at the location of the implantation. And here's some of the lesions. I'm a pathologist, so I'm gonna put this thing here for you to get you bored a little bit more. So these are the types of uh, lesions that you can see. ISO is very, um, particular, and it's, it's, it's a good guidance, because they actually come with different types of cells that can be at the site of implantation. And based on the number of cells that you have in a high power field, if you're gonna give it a score of one to four. So this is very important, and this is um, well-defined, and there's not a lot of variability on this. You just count cells, very simple. Now, there's some uh, characteristics such as necrosis. Necrosis is cell death. If there's death associated with an implant, that go revert into a more um, subjective scale of minimal to, to severe, from one to four. In addition to cell death at the location of implantation, you can also have increased red blood, cell, uh, uh, blood vessels, it's called neovascularization. Also, depending on the number of buds of, you can count those, which is really great, but when you get to, to grade three, it's a little bit more subjective. Fibrosis is also what's called scar tissue, so presence of scar tissue, how thick it is and how extensive it is. And some, some types of implants, depending on the implantation site, may also cause fatty or fat, fat cells or deeper side infiltrates, and those can also be scored. So this is the histological evaluation system, uh, evaluation system that is done according to part six, and this kind of standardizes the way any pathologist will look at these things and give you a consistent result in something that could be uh, fairly subjective. The USP guideline uh, is a little bit more simple in that uh, you usually do the implantation in the intermuscular in rabbits, you need at least two animals, and subcutaneous in rats, and you need five animals. The period is also guided, it's 120 hours, not less than 120 hours in the rabbit, and at least seven days in the rat. And the evaluation is to compare with a control site. And the only thing you're looking here is when you put the device in the implantation location, you have a capsule forming, a, a scab of scar tissue forming around it, and you just measure the, thick, uh, the diameter of uh, the width of the capsule. And based on that, you got your score. So it's a, a little bit more simple than the, what the ISO guideline says. <laughs> 
All right, so let's go into genotoxic evaluation. Genotoxicity evaluation is required if there is a need, based on your chemical characterization, to um, evaluate potential for carcinogenesis. And you usually test your extracts in multiple types of tests that I'm going to go through very rapidly. So the, the, there are some uh, updates on the guidance and specifically on your prepare your samples for testing. Uh, the, the Annex A does provide this guidance and whether or not you need to include an in vivo test in the follow-up, what the in vitro vivo test will be. There's some debate about that, if there is required or not, which is the best test. And uh, so this is basically what it says here. And the purpose of the genotoxicity is to evaluate either if your extract or any components of your extract will cause mutations or will cause chromosomal damage. Ultimately, these changes are indicative of carcinogenic potential. Some of the considerations is, as I said, you will need to look at the chemical cons constituents of your extract, not just for what comes out of the device, but also if there is any residues, any degradation period uh, products, or if there's potential in metabolites. That means that maybe what was on the extract was not potential, does not have a potential for carcinogenic, but when it gets to the body and it's transformed, you may have metabolites that do cause those alterations. And in these particular cases, you still may need to require to perform genotoxicity testing. It is also important uh, if there's any toxicological information for any of these components that you consider that to define your uh, genetic toxicology uh, testing strategy, any information that is uh, ex pre-existent and is relevant. If you have comparison uh, materials that you can compare to, and then other things are to do as exposure route. If it's a medical device, it's only going to contact with the skin, and it's very unlikely that it'll going to be systemic exposure. Or if you have a patient population like children, that you will have more concerns in terms of carcinogenic potential than an elderly population. And also the duration. If it's something that is going to be 24 hours, not a big deal. But if it's something that's going to be implanted for a year or for the lifetime, then it's going to be more important to evaluate if there's a potential for carcinogenesis. Uh, again, if you have an updated material, you already had a medical device. Now you got something different that is going to have a different residual exposure to an equivalent device. And if there's any concerns for these residual products, then you may still need to conduct genetic toxicology testing. So most commonly, what are done is in vitro tests. The one that is most usually done for every single medical device is the AIMS test. The AIMS test, why? It's because there, this, the AIMS test is a single in vitro test for genotoxicity that has the highest correlation with the carcinogenic potential. When people did these for many chemicals, they see that there's more than 50%. If something comes out positive in an AIMS, there's more than 50% possibility that this is going to be carcinogenic. And it is why people usually run the AIMS test. It's also in vitro test is fairly cheap, so people like this one. The, these three tests, uh, I'm going to talk briefly, you really can choose whatever you feel that is more appropriate. There is some... Uh, some people may say that the Muslim form of TKSA is preferred by the FDA, but they all, while these tests for mutations, these, uh, all, all of them test for uh, chromosomal alterations, uh, so they all have the same endpoints and give you similar types of results and information. Let's talk briefly what the differences are. So in the AIMS test, you test uh, your, um, your extract, with uh, strains of salmonella and E. coli, these are the test system, with and without metabolic uh, activation to see if there's something that needs to be metabolized in order to become a carcinogenic, and, uh, and mimic the mammalian uh, liver metabolism. And then you evaluate the number of revertins. Usually, the more revertins, the more likely, that means the more mutation it causes, the more likely it is to cause cancer. The in vitro chromosomal aberration assay, 
It's a really cute picture here. Uh, usually what you look in, you're looking at cells that are dividing, specifically a certain phase of division that is the metaphase. And you also do uh, the S9, which is the metabolic activation. And you count a certain number of cells per replication. And what you do in the chromosome aberration is you look for changes in the chromosomes. Either there's um, a gap, a break, a deletion, that means it's gone, a fragment, which I, or an exchange, like the two chromosomes swap material. It's really cute, but it's also very subjective. Some people love it, some people don't love it that much, so it's really up to you, but you're looking at chromosomal alterations for this assay, and also for this one. The mouse lymphoma assay, you can use a mammalian cells, um, and you look at growth of colonies. Now, the advantage of this test, and that may be why the FDA likes it, is because in addition to detect point mutations, it also, so it's a mutagenic assay, it also looks for deletions uh, and even translocations, so for changes in the, at the chromosome. So it, both, you can evaluate both mutagenicity and clastogenic endpoints. So it's kind of a two-in-one, but it's very labor-intensive, and, and so that's one of the advantages of this test. Another one that you can use is the in vitro micronucleus assay. Is the, if there is a change in the chromosomes, it is the, the basis of this assay is that fragments of chromosome will be generated, and these fragments are called micronucleus or micronuclei. It's quicker and easier to score, to score than the chromosomal aberration. It is more reproducible if you're able to standardize it. Uh, and we're looking at uh, the cells need to progress to the next interface. That means beyond the metaphase that would have been scored in the chromosomal aberration. So these are technicalities. This is a system that could be, this is a test that could be automated and has that advantage over the chromosomal aberration. And because we're counting micronucleus is also slightly less subjective. It doesn't give you, however, the information of what's actually going on in the chromosomes. So if there are any additional relevant factors, so such as uh, you that can influence, the, such as um, any known genotoxic mechanism related to the chemicals that are on your extract, or there's any exposure, that means pharmacokinetic characteristics of this extract, that can influence the possibility for genotoxicity and therefore carcinogenicity, you may need to be required to perform an in vivo test. Now, these in vivo tests have the exact same correlates to the ones that we said. There's the in vivo chromosomal aberration, and there's also the in, vi in vivo micronucleus bone marrow or peripheral blood assay. Which one should you choose? Uh, you, there's a lot of debate about that too. I'm gonna to talk about the in vivo micronucleus test that, as I was saying before, forms these little fragments that look like nuclei. And uh, usually you can count a thousand cells or even up to 20,000 cells per replicate and automated and can be for the medical devices. Usually they are administered interperitoneally or IV, uh, but it's possible also for some uh, situations that you can administer orally using this is a, an oral gavage instrument. For medical devices, you, you are usually required for this in vivo test, all of them, to test polar vehicles that administer IV and non-polar vehicles that administer IP. An in vitro assay is not necessary, or in vivo assay, I'm sorry, is not necessary if the user can demonstrate that the, uh, the qualities of the extractable profile of the test article uh, are less than the amount of material required for a positive response with the potent L-characterized in vivo micronucleus genotoxin. That means that with your chemical characterization and with your risk assessment, you may be able to justify not having to do these in vivo tests and possibly even some of the in vitro genotoxic tests. If, any, if you do need to conduct this because you have new materials that you have not characterized or a potential carcinogenic potential uh, that have not been described previously, uh, and if any of this test comes out positive, then there may be a question for carcinogenicity evaluation. So, when can this be, cannot be justified? So obviously people don't want to do carcinogenicity, very expensive, very long-term studies. If you already, your materials have adequate data on human use or exposure. So if there's already, that information is already available. 
If the materials are expected to give rise to solid carcinogen, I'm going to talk what this means. Or if there's any methodological constraints or other circumstances that lim limit the productivity of this test, you may need or may can, or can request, uh, request a waiver for carcinogenicity testing. But if you need to do it, usually for medical devices, contrary to drugs, one animal species may be sufficient. Uh, testing, uh, you will want to characterize your extracts very well to know exactly what's going to the animal. And if you have an implantation study, as I said previously, implantation studies should not have carcinogenicity as an end point. And the reason is because sometimes due to at, at the location of the implantation, due to the characteristics, the physical characteristics of the implant, if it's rough on the surface, there may be this, that is called a solid state of carcinogenesis. That means just the fact that the implant, the device is implanted there, you may have a local cancer forming there, and this is usually not something good because the, this will confound or it's not considered a carcinogenic definitely material because it's a local effect. What would be a carcinogenic material is if you implant your medical device, for instance, in a bone, and you end up having tumors in the thyroid gland then you know that there's something leaking from your device that will cause carcinogenic in a systemic location. And this is really what sometimes, even though the implantation studies are not good to evaluate carcinogenicity, if you do an implantation study and in your long-term or chronic study, you end up having tumors away from the location of implantation, this usually is an indicator that your device may be carcinogenic and may be causing tumors. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is immocompatibility. Immocompatibility is a requirement for tests for any material, any medical device that will be contacted directly or indirectly with blood. It, testing for immocompatibility is defined under ISO 10993 Part 4. Anything that interacts with blood could be implant device, but also external communicated device. The selection of the test method is really largely based on the design and the materials and obviously the clinical use. The parameters that are evaluating uh, are these four types of parameters, and um, I'll show you some tables um, shortly. So you want to know if your medical device, by contacting directly or indirectly with the blood, destroys red blood cells. That's called hemolysis. This is very important and it's a very common endpoint for immunocompatibility. The other thing that also required by the FDA is if you have uh, an implantable device, you want to evaluate if it causes thrombos, or, uh, thrombogenicity, or embolus. Or you also want to know if there's an impact on coagulation. Either there's going to be an increase in clotting or a decrease in clotting. But increase in clotting is important because if there's an increase in clotting, you're going to have thrombus. And finally, complement activation, which could lead either to thrombogenesis, but can also lead to other inflammatory responses. Now, in terms of testing, you can choose the in vivo uh, immunocompatibility, obviously for implantable devices, but there are some of these tests that can be done in vitro. And you can use a static system, which basically you have a vial with blood and you put your device inside, that's static. Or you can have a simulation device that makes the blood circulate while contacting with the medical device, and that's called a dynamic system. So really, you will choose this based on your device. You want to evaluate, uh, definitely, the, you want to choose the appropriate model of system so you can adequately see what are the effects with the blood in any material or component of the medical device. Hemolysis, as I said, destruction of red blood cells. And specifically, uh, sometimes you may need to design further tests if there is any particular physical characteristic of your medical device and implantation. So this is just an example of the types of tests, depending on the device examples, if you have a cir circulating blood contacting device or an external communication, de communication device, the test category that we discussed a little bit, and this gives you actually a lot of guidance. You can go into these lines of uh, types of devices and you'll know automatically what types of tests you need to conduct. And there's uh, implantable devices, circulation, other categories, everything, stents, prosthetic valves, et cetera. So this is a good guidance from the part four that tells you what types of tests you're likely to require for that. And that's it.